Us UK deal will revolutionize world trade. Let us take Donald Trump both seriously and literally. When he says he wants to abolish all trade barriers, let us assume he means it. Back in June, the president stunned his fellow heads of government at the Quebec G7 summit by telling them, no tariffs, no barriers, that's the way it should be. And no subsides. A world where all such distortions were removed from markets would indeed be vastly wealthier. We would all benefit, especially people on low incomes who would gain the most from a fall in prices. Pretty much every mainstream economist from both ends of the political spectrum endorses the idea of scrapping trade restrictions. So why doesn't it happen? Why don't countries simply drop their tariff and non-tariff barriers? Why, indeed, are we seeing a reversal of the tariff elimination that had been happening at the WTO until the 1990s? The answer is that free trade is counterintuitive and therefore unpopular. Protectionists make all sorts of claims that, though false, sound plausible. We can't carry on with a trade deficit, we need to defend strategic industries, we need to bring jobs back, we need to maintain our food safety standards. How to overcome these objections? Here is an idea, what if we removed all trade barriers among a group of compatible countries countries, in other words, with the same legal systems, accountancy methods, business norms, and wage levels? Countries, in short, that could eliminate trade restrictions without triggering fears about offshoring, mass immigration, or shoddy standards. This week, at simultaneous launch events in Washington and London, I and others are publishing a draft US UK trade agreement that would do precisely that. It has been drawn up over several months by market oriented foundations on both sides of the Atlantic, including Cato, Heritage, the American Enterprise Institute, the Manhattan Institute, and the Competitive Enterprise Institute. This is the first time, as far as anyone can remember, that all these heroic organizations have worked together on the same project. Its core idea is simple what is legal in one country should automatically be legal in the other. Mutual recognition should cover goods services, and professional qualifications. If a drug is approved by the FDA, that should be good enough for the Brits. If a trader can practice in the city of London, he should be free to work on Wall Street. Where there are different standards, businesses should be free to follow whichever they prefer something that will lead, unprecedentedly, to downward pressure on regulations. This is a very different model from that pursued by the Obama administration in its Atlantic and Pacific trade talks, both of which rested on establishing common standards. What we propose instead is reciprocity. We say nothing about labor laws or eco rules, not because they are unimportant, but, on the contrary, because they are important enough to be addressed in their own right rather than tacked on as a code to something else. In theory, you could have mutual recognition deals with every country and trust to your robust legal system to uphold standards. In practice, though, voters want to accept that unless they have confidence in the other nation as regulators. That is why we propose beginning with two states that already form the most natural economic and cultural unit namely the United States and Britain. Each is already the other's largest single investor, with a million Britons working for American companies and a million Americans working for British companies. A tie-up of this kind between the world's largest and fifth-largest economies would revolutionize the world trading system. Instead of trade deals that enforce common regulations, thereby benefiting the multinationals and raising barriers against new entrants, we do finally have a trade deal that worked for the consumer. And why stop at the US and Britain? There are other English-speaking common law countries whose systems of corporate government and professional credentials resemble ours. Shouldn't we aim to extend mutual recognition to all countries with interoperable systems and equivalent levels of GDP per head, such as Canada, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand? And what about Israel, which is often forgotten, but which has the same common law as the others, and is, for business purposes, effectively English-speaking? Something along the lines of what we re-proposing already exists between Australia and New Zealand, and is arguably the most successful trade deal on the planet. Imagine a trade deal that works for the little guy, not the corporations, the nexus that draws together countries representing one-third of the world's economy based on a shared commitment to liberty. It would, for once, justify the president's superlatives. And, with a bit of goodwill, it could happen during his first term.
What are we waiting for? China says world trade system not perfect, needs reform. Beijing, the current world trade system is not perfect and China supports reforms to it, including to the World Trade Organization, to make it fairer and more effective, Beijing is top diplomat said. China is locked in a bitter trade war with the United States and has vowed repeatedly to uphold the multilateral trading system and free trade with the WTO at its center. But speaking late on Thursday to reporters after meeting French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, Chinese State Councillor Wang Yi said some reforms could be good. While certain doubts have been raised about the current international trading system, China has always supported the protection of free trade and believes that multilateralism with the WTO at its core should be strengthened, Wang added. At the same time, we do not believe that the current system is perfect and without flaws, he said. China supports necessary reforms and perfection of the current system, including to the WTO, to make it fairer, more effective, and more rational, Wang added. The basic tenets of the WTO in opposing protectionism and supporting free trade should not change, but the rights of developing nations should also not be overlooked, he said. The aim of reform should be to allow countries to enjoy the development fruits of globalization more fairly, not to further widen the differences between South and North, Wang said. WTO reforms need to include listening to voices from all parties and broad consultation and should especially listen to or respect the opinions of developing countries rather than just allowing one person to have a say, he added. The issue of WTO reform is extremely complex and involves many areas. China hopes all parties remain patient and advance step by step. His remarks come as China and the United States may return to the negotiating table with the threat of new U.S. tariffs looming. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin has extended an invitation to talks to his counterparts in Beijing. Trump administration should not be mistaken. But China will not buckle to U.S. demands in any trade negotiations, the major state-run China Daily newspaper said in an editorial on Friday. After Chinese officials welcomed an invitation from Washington for a new round of talks, the official China Daily said that while China was serious about resolving the standoff through talks, it would not be rolled over, despite concerns over a slowing economy and a falling stock market at home. The Trump administration should not be mistaken that China will surrender to the U.S. demands. It has enough fuel to drive its economy even if a trade war is prolonged, the newspaper said in an editorial. If the United States imposed new levies on Chinese imports then Beijing will not hesitate to take countermeasures against U.S. tariffs to safeguard China's interests, it added. President Donald Trump said on Twitter on Thursday that the United States holds the upper hand in talks. We are under no pressure to make a deal with China, they are under pressure to make a deal with us, Trump tweeted. Our markets are surging, theirs are collapsing. The U.S. administration is readying a final list of $200 billion in Chinese imports on which it plans to levy tariffs of 10 to 25 percent in coming days, which would ramp up the trade war between the world's two largest economies. Trump said last week that he also had tariffs on an additional $267 billion worth of goods ready on short notice, if I want. A meeting among cabinet-level officials could ease market worries over the escalating tariff war that threatens to engulf all trade between the world's two largest economies and raise costs for companies and consumers. However, the last round of talks between mid-level U.S. and Chinese officials in August failed to reach any agreement. World trade volume rebound weakens. The Peninsula Dota. After more than four years in the doldrums, world trade volumes have rebounded strongly over the last two years. However, recently, important cyclical indicators and gauges for trade momentum are starting to weaken, QNB noted in its weekly economic commentary yesterday. In fact, according to data from the Dutch Bureau for Economic Policy Analysis, a leading agency in the monitoring of world trade, the three months average Y slash Y growth in world trade volumes jumped from 2.1% over April 2012 April 2016 to 5.2% in January 2018, followed by a slowdown to 3.7% in June. According to QNB analysts, there are two main reasons for the recovery. 
Firstly, IMF data shows that global growth had strengthened from an average of 3.5% twice in 2012 to 2016 to 3.8% in 2017, with a degree of synchronization not seen since 2010. In 2017, the euro area and Japan had accelerated to 2.3% and 1.7% from sluggish growth rates of 0.8% and 1.2%. Between 2012 and 2016, the U.S. economy regained momentum to grow 2.3% after its industrial sector endured a shallow recession in 2015 to 2016, while emerging markets M were able to grow faster at 4.8%. China managed to control capital outflows and avoid a deeper deceleration or new bouts of disorderly devaluation. Secondly, commodity prices have also rebounded after the 2014 to 2016 weakness. According to the World Bank, both energy and non-energy commodities slumped by 69% and 25%, respectively, from June 2014 to there through in January 2016. Subsequently, they grew by 123% and 12% in the 32 months to August 2018. This is key to world trade volumes as commodities are one of the largest and most volatile portions of tradable goods. However, recently, important cyclical indicators and gauges for trade momentum are starting to weaken. Three months average Y slash Y growth in world trade volumes have slowed by 150 BP from January to June 2018. This slowdown is corroborated by cargo volume at major ports. On a similar note, surveys such as the Global Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index exhibit that new export orders peaked in early 2018 and have now fallen. Slower world trade is somewhat surprising as commodity prices remain from and consensus forecasts indicate that the world is on course to see a robust 3.7% growth in 2018, its best performance since 2011. Importantly, the U.S. economy is running at full speed. Q2 GDP growth boomed at 4.2% annualized pace and monthly indicators suggest a similar pace will be sustained in Q3. The private sector's optimism in particular seems sky high with key surveys such as the Institute for Supply Management and Small Business Confidence close to or reaching all-time highs over the last month. Although heightened trade frictions may lead to new tariffs impacting trade volumes in the future, their share of world trade is marginal. According to Capital Economics, only around 1% of world trade have been affected by new tariffs so far and bilateral trade between the U.S. and China accounts for just 3.2% of world exports. Slower growth in non-U.S. advanced economies and China appears to be the culprit for weaker trade. Consensus forecasts for the euro area and Japan in 2018 slipped from 2.4% to 2.1% and from 1.4% to 1%, respectively since April. Similarly, M growth consensus forecasts in 2018 declined by 24 BPS. China's growth, particularly, has cooled as regulatory financial tightening targets shadow banks and slows credit growth. Latest activity data shows that retail sales and fixed asset investment growth registered their slowest growth in over a decade in the last few months. Looking ahead, a further slowdown in world trade is likely. On the downside, activity in the euro area and Japan is expected to soften with consensus forecast at 1.8% and 1% growth in 2019, respectively. In the U.S., monetary tightening should ensure that growth slows to around 2.5% next year well above GDP's likely C.2% potential rate. In response, the Federal Reserve may be forced to step up the pace of policy tightening. Consequently, M central banks may be forced to hike their policy rates to limit capital outflows and FX pressures, constraining growth. Finally, the US-China trade tensions are at a clear risk of escalating further. On the upside, China is expected to maintain 6-plus percent growth as both fiscal and monetary policies are eased and authorities prioritize expansion over financial deleveraging. Despite headwinds associated with tighter USD liquidity and a stronger USD, M's in aggregate are also resilient and expected to grow by 5% in 2019. 
In brief, world trade has been a fair reflection of overall global growth, a phenomenon that is currently changing given the recent slip following softening non-U.S. activity. However, the world economy is expected to grow at a healthy 3.6% in 2019. In the absence of major shocks, this should ultimately support a relatively high yet somewhat slower world trade growth. Brexiters launch World Trade Deal Advertising Campaign to Tackle Project Fear A new advertising campaign is to be launched to promote the benefits of a world trade deal and combat the remainder project fear. Leave means leave is to put a full-page advert in 30 regional papers with more than 5 million readers. The advert will point out that a world trade deal, which means the UK does not compromise with the EU and uses World Trade Organization rules instead, is better than the Prime Minister S. Checker's proposal. Economists for free trade have estimated that a world trade deal with no EU deal could boost Britain by 1 trillion. The selected newspapers cover the length and breadth of the whole nation, from London S Evening Standard to Newcastle S Chronicle, from the South Wales Echo and Evening Post to the Cambridge News, and from the Plymouth Herald to Scotland S Daily Record. The ad dismisses the Chequers' proposal as same old, same old. It compares the Prime Minister S favour deal with the New Deals, and new opportunities a world trade deal would bring. It warns that checkers will shackle the UK to EU laws, ensure the continuation of mass migration, and commit the UK to handing over 39 billion to Brussels. By comparison, a world trade deal would give the UK the freedom to trade around the world, create a fair and managed migration system, and reduce the cost of living for British people. Commenting on the ass, Richard Tice, vice chairman of Leave Means Leave, said, We have relaunched the Leave campaign, and we will stop at nothing to ensure the Prime Minister chucks checkers and delivers Brexit in its entirety. Leave Means Leave will be engaging with as many people across the country to ensure Project Fear is torn apart so that the economic benefits of Brexit are revealed. The advertising campaign is to be launched as Leave Means Leave has organized a series of Chuck Checkers rallies across the UK. Former Cabinet Ministers David Davis MP, Owen Patterson MP, and David Jones MP, Jacob Rees-Mogg MP, Nigel Farage MEP, and Kate Howey MP are just some of the names confirmed for the Leave Means Leave rallies. The rallies kick off next Saturday, the 22nd of September, in Bolton, where former Brexit Secretary David Davis, Nigel Farage MEP, and Kate Howey MP, Labour, will take the campaign's message to thousands of people in the University of Bolton Stadium for the nearly sold-out event. On Sunday, the 30th of September, the campaign heads to Birmingham during Conservative Party Conference, where Tory MPs Peter Bone and Andrea Jenkins will join Nigel Farage and CLLR Brendan Chilton of Labour Leave. The tour will then continue under Torquay, Bournemouth, Gateshead, and Harrogate.